On the 7th of December 1946, at around 3 a.m., the bellboy on duty at the Weinkoff Hotel in downtown Atlanta received a room service order. He collected the order and rode one of the two available hotel elevators to the fifth floor. Anticipating a quick stop, he left his keys on a chair in the elevator, blocked the elevator door open, and made his way to room 510. He stepped inside for just a few minutes to complete the delivery. But by the time he tried to leave the room, he found the corridor outside filled with choking black smoke. This was the beginning of one of the worst hotel fires in American history. The Weinkoff Hotel opened in October 1913. It was the creation of William F. Weinkoff, a Floridian real estate developer. In his early 20s, he had stopped in Atlanta on a business trip and loved it so much that he made the city his home. After a long and successful career, he decided to contribute to the skyline of the city by building his own hotel there. The vacant lot he chose to build on was small, just 19 by 21 meters, or 63 by 70 feet. To maximize space, the Weinkoff Hotel would be tall rather than broad, with 15 floors overall. It would also be luxurious. Each room had a private bathroom, and the ground floor lobby featured solid mahogany furnishings and plush carpeting worth $3,000. To serve the hotel's many floors, there were two elevators and one staircase running up the middle of the building. The stairway was continuous from the third floor to the roof and opened directly onto each floor with no doors to partition it off. The building had a steel frame with concrete floors and clay tile cladding. Windows and other fixtures were sometimes metal but more often wooden. Most doors were wooden, and had wooden transom windows above them to promote ventilation throughout the building. The walls in guest areas were decorated up to waist height with painted burlap, and many rooms were lavishly wallpapered, some with as many as seven layers of paper. Weinkoff ran the hotel that took his name for several years before handing over day-to-day -day operations to new owners. There was one condition, however that he and his wife retained an apartment on the seventh floor of the hotel for the rest of their lives. As well as being well appointed, the hotel was considered very safe. It was advertised as fireproof, with this claim even printed on hotel stationery. It was a claim that many people had great confidence in, especially after 1942, when two small fires at the hotel were both contained to a single room and extinguished without incident. Over many years of operation, the building was frequently redecorated, but did not see any major structural changes. Being a historic building, it was exempted from compliance with new building codes that came into force in the late 1920s, which would otherwise have required the addition of a second staircase for emergencies. On the 6th of December 1946, the hotel was busy, 304 guests were registered as staying that night. Many were in town to do their Christmas shopping, but there was also a large youth group with more than 40 members, and a number of people who were there to see the premiere of the Disney film Song of the South, which was taking place at a cinema across the road. On the third floor, a guest room in the West Corridor was in the process of being converted to an office for staff use. The bed, a chair, and other furniture had been moved out into the corridor and left there so the office furniture could be moved in. It was here that a small fire began in the early hours of the 7th of December. No definitive cause has been determined, although likely scenarios which have been considered include deliberate arson or a discarded cigarette. At around 3.15 a.m., while delivering a room service order, a bellboy encountered smoke in the corridor of the fifth floor. But the smoke was so thick that he was forced to take shelter in the room that he had been delivering room service to. Almost half an hour passed after this before the first and only call was placed to the fire department. Records are conflicted about what caused this delay, 
but accounts from staff indicate that it took some time for them to become aware of the fire, and that some further time was spent trying to call guests on their room telephones to warn them. Once the fire department was alerted, they were on the scene almost immediately. The nearest firehouse was just a 30 second drive away. Despite this quick response, by the time they arrived, the situation was extremely bad. Smoke billowed from the hotel, and guests could be seen trying to clamber down the exterior of the building using ropes made from bedsheets. As the first rescue ladder was set up, trapped guests began jumping from windows. In most cases, the windows were the only way out for guests trapped inside the hotel. The interior corridors were completely filled with smoke, as was the only stairwell in the centre of the building. Guests on the upper two floors might conceivably have been able to reach the roof, but they were unaware that this was possible. Worse still, smoke and flames were quickly infiltrating guest rooms. The wooden doors with their transom windows above were not fireproof. Indeed, many guests had left the transom windows open for ventilation. As guests opened exterior windows to try and dissipate smoke or wave for help, the fire received fresh oxygen and only grew more rapidly. The vast majority of the 304 guests would have to leave the hotel through a window. On the lower floors, some were in reach of the fire department ladders. The bellboy, who had originally discovered the fire and the guest he had been delivering room service to, escaped in this way. Other guests tied bedsheets together to climb down from higher floors until they were within reach of the ladders. Many guests lost their grip and fell while attempting to climb to safety. Many others jumped, either to escape the smoke and flames or because they aimed to land in one of a number of nets held by the firemen below. Even those lucky enough to be caught in a net often sustained serious injuries from the fall, and did not always survive. The next nearest building to the hotel was just three metres, or ten feet away, across an alley. Some guests tried to jump this gap, most of them unsuccessfully. After some time, firemen arrived at the windows of the adjacent building and extended ladders across the gap, so that guests could climb across to safety. By this time, the Atlanta Fire Rescue Department had been supplemented by resources from multiple other fire departments. 49 pieces of equipment were on site, including ladders, engines, and pumps. Firemen fought the fire from inside the building, from the street, and from adjacent buildings, while also operating rescue ladders and manning nets. In total, 119 people died in the fire and a further 65 were injured. 120 were able to escape uninjured from the burning hotel. William F. Weinkoff and his wife, Grace S. Weinkoff, both perished while attempting to escape. In the aftermath of the fire, one photograph in particular was widely circulated. It was taken by graduate student Arnold Hardy and depicted a guest, Daisy McCumber, falling from a window of the hotel towards the street below. Daisy ultimately survived her fall, albeit with serious injuries. Arnold, an amateur photographer, was shocked to see only two nets being used to try and catch dozens of people. As such, he wished to capture a deliberately shocking image that would, in his own words, stir up the public to where they would do something about this and equip every truck in the city with a net. After taking his pictures, Arnold noticed some police officers trying to gain access to a nearby pharmacy. He recommended that they break down the door, but they refused. Arnold broke down the door himself and was arrested, while the pharmacy was turned into a first aid station. Upon his release later that day, Arnold developed and sold his photographs. They were reprinted hundreds of times in many newspapers and magazines, and did indeed stir up public outrage and a strong desire for change. His photograph of Daisy McCumber later won the Pulitzer Prize. 
Changes that were enacted included updates to building codes to mandate doors that could withstand fire for a known length of time, as well as doors separating stairs from corridors, and multiple exit routes for high occupancy buildings. Self-closing fire doors also came into common usage following the Weinkoff fire. It was noted that the hotel had been able to claim that it was fireproof because the structure of the building itself could withstand fire, even though it wouldn't allow any people within it to survive. The language used in many guidelines and pieces of legislation was changed to make it clear that the priority when fireproofing buildings was the preservation of life, not the preservation of the building. The hotel sat empty for several years after the fire, before it was eventually purchased and renovated. Major changes included the addition of a second staircase, as well as an exterior fire escape. Over subsequent years, it changed hands many times. It is now the Ellis Hotel, and is one of the few remaining grand hotels from the early 20th century in downtown Atlanta. A nearby historical marker informs visitors of the significance of the hotel, and the lasting impact the fire which ravaged it had.